Very good. So we're going to be in Galatians, but before we jump into Galatians, let's just go before God uh, in prayer, shall we? God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for my family. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, and I thank you for this fantastic opportunity to learn about you, to grow, to seek to understand you more, to be one with you, God. I thank you for this time, and I pray that you just be with us, God, in our learnings and our comprehensions and understandings. I pray, Holy Spirit, just fill this place. Be here. God, speak to each one of us individually. Um, we're always going through something, and something is always on our minds. And so, God, I pray that you speak to us specific to our situation tonight. Um, and I pray that may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be holy and acceptable unto you, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity. In your name we pray, amen. So, Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. To all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So, when we start a book it's good to have context. Who are the Galatians? Who wrote this book? Who did, who did he write this to? When did he write this? And why did he write this? And so as we jump into this book, it's good to have an understanding of who wrote this book. So if we look at verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, to the brethren who are with me. Oh, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So we have who it's from. It's from the Apostle Paul. And we have who it's to, the churches in Galatia. Now, in this, this is one of the very few epistles that is not specifically addressed to a specific church, but rather churches, the churches of Galatia. And so the people of Galatia, or the Galatians. Now, who are the Galatians? If you know a little bit about uh, Galatia or Galatia in general, you'll know that it actually broke off from uh, people who were called the Gauls. And if you know the Gauls, or if you uh, uh, kind of history-wise, the Gauls were these uh, really tall, fair-skinned, kind of strong people who hailed kind of from the uh, like the the area of France. In fact, the Gauls and the Franks would kind of mix together, and eventually, you know, the Franks uh, would, take, would, would take over, and that's why we have France. But the Gauls were kind of intermixed in that area. And so part of them migrated down to Galatia, or what we know as kind of uh, modern-day Turkey, you know, that area, kind of along the Mediterranean. And they settled there. Now, what's interesting about the, the Gauls is that they are, um, <laughs> they are described as these very uh, tall, light-skinned, light-haired, light-eyed people. In fact, I have a really cool uh, historic, uh, his, uh, historic quote from a 4th century historian named, uh, oh boy, <laughs> Amanus uh, Mar Marcellinus. Oh boy. Um, anyway, I have a quote from a historian around that time. And in it, he says, almost all the all the Gauls are tall and fair-skinned with reddish hair. Their savage eyes make them fearful objects. They are eager to quarrel and excessively trus uh, truculent. When, in the course of a dispute, any of them calls on his wife with a creature of gleaming eyes much stronger than her husband, they are more than a match for a whole group of foreigners, especially when the woman with swollen neck and gnashing teeth swings her great white arms and begins to deliver a rain of punches mixed with kicks like missiles launched by the twisted strings of a catapult. So a very strong people, a very bold and very large people. Could you imagine? Um, in fact, it even talks about uh, with rippling muscles and white skin, their hair is blonde, and they have a mustache that goes into their mouth, and that's all they have. So you, you can imagine these giant people, um, and they would have looked incredibly different from the people uh, that were in the Mediterranean. That, you know, you and your Mediterranean people are more short. They're about my height, dark hair, dark eyes. And they would stand out in stark contrast 
to the Mediterranean people just in general. And they would especially stand out to, uh, to Jews. They would look completely different than anyone that was Jewish at all. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, see, when Paul ministered to the Galatians, when he started these churches, when he started evangelizing, there were people, they are, the, the Galatians took it, uh, like, really quickly. They, they loved it so much. In fact, they embraced the gospel of grace. But there were these people called the Judaizers. And these Judaizers would do something. And I'm going to pause right there. So let's continue, shall we? So, verse 3, grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Paul here is starting out this book, this chapter, uh, this verse, with saying grace to you and peace from God, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul is starting out this book by saying grace to you. Which is interesting because there were people who came to the people of Galatia saying, hey, it's great. I'm so glad that you've become saved. I'm so glad that you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Has anyone told you uh, about the Sabbath? Oh, you obviously know about circumcision and, you know, keeping the law. You guys are doing that, right? And the Galatians, you know, wanting to be good Christians, go, well, wait, wait, hold on. What are you talking about? You know, we just, we accepted this free gift. And, the Jude- and these people that were called the Judaizers, they go, oh, no, no, no. There's much more than that. We, like, don't get me wrong. Like, Jesus died for you, but, you know, you, you have to follow the law. Now, if you've been with us uh, since a couple of years ago, or if you've been with us while we were back in Romans, you'll know that the law brings death. In fact, the law just simply shows us that we're unable to keep the law. And you can imagine, you can imagine these giant uh, Gaulish people, these giant Galatians, uh, trying to to follow the rules of the Jews. It would, in fact, it would feel very strange for these these people who were of uh, just a completely different origin. You know, they would not look like Jews at all, and they were trying to follow Jewish traditions, follow the Sabbath, circumcision, that sort of thing. It would look very strange. And Paul says, wait, hold on, guys, what are you doing? Oh, wait, he hasn't said that yet. Hold on. (laughs) Let's go back into it. Verse 6, I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, who, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him now be accursed. Man, these are some strong words. Paul, like a loving father, is going to the Galatians and going, wait, wait, whoa, hold on, guys. What are you doing? Why have you turned away from the gospel of grace? Why are you suddenly turning to this gospel of works? In fact, this is a perverted gospel. This is a different gospel. Who brought this to you? And, you know, we can look at these Galatians and we can go, ah, man, they totally missed it. But, you know, this is something that subtly we can do. This is something that actually very easily kind of just permeates into our lives. You know, when you're first saved, you are excited. You're, like, you're, you're revitalized. You're rebound. You know, you were blind, but now you see. Uh, deaf, but now you hear. Lost, but now you're found. And you are excited. In fact, we, we, we call this new believers, or we say that new believers are always on fire. And it's beautiful to see, right? Suddenly, they're like, they're devouring the Word. They're searching into the Word, and they're eating the Word. And then sometimes, 
it slowly fades. And what was this beautiful fire, this explosion, um, and this just abounding mercy and grace slowly stagnates. And then you might go, oh, shoot, um, something must be wrong. I'm not sure what I'm doing. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to pray more. Maybe, maybe I need to cut stuff out of my life. And all of this is true, for sure. If there's stuff that you have placed in your life that, you know, like takes the place of the Father, please, please remove it. Take it out. Give God the throne in your life. But sometimes when we are aiming to do good, put rules and regulations in our lives, we can turn what was the gospel of grace into a gospel of works. And that perverts the gospel. In fact, we know, well, <laughs> there's technically, oh man, um, hang tight. There, there's two ways to go to heaven. One is to be perfect. I screwed that up a long time ago. <laughs> it's impossible. No one here is perfect. And that's why we needed a sacrifice. That's why we needed a perfect sacrifice, someone to take our place. For we know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So, the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And it's not by works. In fact, Jesus says, Take, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you, and I will give you rest. So if you feel weary, heavy laden, tired, and you can't quite place it, and you don't know what it is, I would recommend just to scrutinize your life. Take, take stock. Take investment. Maybe there's something in your life that you've added onto your life, a little bit of Jesus plus. Because truthfully, it's just the grace. It's by grace that we've been saved. Not by works, lest any man should boast, right? And so the Galatians, being excited, being, um, being exuberant in, in, their, in their love and their dedication, also took on these, uh, these other Gospels, this perverse Gospel, this Gospel of uh, a, being a Judaizer. And man, Paul gets into it in this book. But truthfully, what I love about this book is the freedom that it brings. It's by grace, guys. That's it. That's the only thing that we need. We just need Jesus' grace. Verse 6, I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you, then we have preached, then, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, I want to take a moment here and just talk about um, other religions. Because it talks, it says here, now even if we, like even if I come to you and I say, hey, like, you know, there are multiple paths to heaven. You could, Actually, you, all you got to do is just be a really good person. No, that's not the case. It's only Jesus, right? But if I come up here and I say that and you go, okay, that sounds good. No, it's what this book says. It's what God says. And always be a Berean and dig into Scripture. And what I find is really interesting about this is in verse 8, it says, Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you. And what I find curious is that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because you know Joseph Smith. You know the teachings of the Mormons. Did you know that he was given these teachings by an angel called Moroni? It was literally, well, according to them, it was literally an angel from heaven. And he brought with him another gospel, 
a gospel that is, man, if you read that book, it is wild. And it contradicts the Bible over and over and over again. And it talks about stuff that is just not true. But yet, I, I kind of wonder, I wonder if it was either, either it was Joseph Smith's own thoughts, or maybe it was a fallen angel that brought another gospel. You know, we see in the scripture that angels are these incredible, powerful beings. In fact, at the very end of Revelation, we see that the, uh, the apostle John accidentally worships an angel, and the angel says, no, 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 stop it, stop it, go, go worship God. And so, you know, if you see an angel and he says, hey, I have this new revelation for you, be careful, be very careful, because if it contradicts what the Word of God is, or what has been revealed to you about God, then you are believing a false gospel. In fact, we even know uh, that the origin ideas of Islam started with a revelation from the angel Gabriel. But again, those words contradict these words. It was a new revelation, a new gospel. It was a gospel based on works. It's interesting, right? Now, you might go, oh, Caleb, well, you know, that's great. Like, you know, if an angel shows up, that's, that, that works out really well. But, I mean, that's probably not going to happen, right? But I think it's really interesting, especially when we believe that God is talking to us, and He says something that might be contrary to who the character of God is or who God is. In fact, a really good example, uh, I used to work out at the Bible College in Marietta, and there were, stories of, uh, there were stories of men, and it was fairly common, actually, for men to, uh, to see a beautiful woman, a beautiful, godly woman who's studying the Word and go, oh, man. And they would pray, and they'd go, oh, God, I pray. And then it was revealed to them that they, that, that woman who they, they were infatuated with it was, in fact, their wife. And so they would go up to that person and say, hey, I just wanted to let you know that God told me that we're going to get married right? That's, it's strange. I mean, talk, talk about charismatic, right? Talk about, uh, um, uh, shoot, what's the word? Bold. Um, and so, like, this, this was a common occurrence. In fact, it wasn't, it wasn't just one random person here or there. Um, and I think one of the best rebuttals I'd ever heard from somebody was, oh, really? God didn't tell me that. <laughs> so we need to be careful. We really need to be careful about what we believe God is telling us. Again, be a Berean. Dig into Scripture. It, we know that our heart is desperately wicked. Like, who can know it, right? And so it's so hard to find out what, is, what are these desires in my own heart that are soulish? What are these desires that are fleshly? And what are these desires that are genuinely spiritual? In fact, we know in Hebrews it says that the living word is powerful and active, able to, div able to divide between joint and marrow, between soul and spirit. And so it's through the word of God that we are able to decipher. It's through the word of God that we're able to uh, unpack, understand what is the will of God. Because, oh man, is it easy today? to get swept up by the whims of the world? Is it easy today to get swept up by what people want us to do, what people want us to believe? It's super easy. And it's super easy for me to follow after my own desires. But be careful. Verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach another gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches another gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accused. Dang. Paul says this twice in a row, so this is really important. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Now, this verse right here, I have highlighted and underlined. This is so important to me. See, the Galatians, 
And they were told by these Judaizers, you have to follow these rules. You have to follow these things in order to be a good Christian. You want to be a good Christian, right? Well, you got to follow this. You got to obey Sabbath. You have to, <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, follow the practical rules, the rules of washing, the rules of what you wear. You can't eat pork. All of these rules. In fact, um, just so you know, and they came up with three rules. They said, oh, no, that's great. In fact, we're wrong. Absolutely, Gentiles can be saved. But we ask that you do these three things. Keep away, or keep away from sexual immorality. Don't eat anything that was strangled. And don't eat anything with blood. That's pretty simple. That's all we have to do. Um, in fact, well... Those are the only three things that we have to worry about, I should say, because keeping uh, free of sexual immorality, oh man, that is a whole host of things, right? That's a whole host of things, and maybe you come from a culture where eating blood is actually just a normal cultural thing. Well, man, that's a tough thing, right? Um, but as far as the laws, I believe that the Galatians were trying to please these Judaizers by following their law. For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Let's look at that. There was a time in my life where I was serving at a church, and I just completely burned out. And I believe it was because of uh, it was because of my dedication and my. Uh, my working for, but it was truthfully for me pleasing or trying to please the leader of this group. It was me trying with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength to please a man, to please a leader, to just get an attaboy from him. And that was fruitless. Um, and I burned out hard while serving in a church. And I blamed God for that. That wasn't right at all. See, if I, in verse 10, for if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. This brings so much freedom to me because I desperately want to be a servant of Christ. But sometimes things get a little mixed up in my head. Sometimes I want to please those around me. Sometimes I want to impress my boss. Sometimes I want to hear an attaboy from someone that I admire and respect. And you know, you kind of always want to be a good person, right? You want, to, you want to make sure that you're respectful in your environment. But I think sometimes this can paralyze us. Sometimes you're not certain, oh, I don't know if I should like tell this person about Christ because I don't want them to judge me or I don't, you know, I don't want to, them to think that I'm judging them. Or I don't want to let them know, like if you have a brother or sister and they've fallen away, and you go, and you go, oh, that's okay, that's fine. No, it's not. You go, oh, well, you know, I don't really want to ruin my friendship with them. I don't want to, are you being a respecter of persons? Or are you trying to the best of your effort to be a servant of God, right? It's tough, but it brings so much freedom if we're only trying to serve God, not man. And man, this is tough for me because I think being a people pleaser, that's something that I like, that is something that I tend to lean toward. And being a people pleaser, it, you have to pick. You either people please or you God please. And there is no in between. Verse 11. <clears throat> But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Let's pause there. So Paul is saying that what he has been teaching, what he taught the Galatians, what he's been teaching all of these churches, is what he's received by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what I like about this or what I enjoy about this is that, and it's all true, 
In fact, we see as we go in between book to book to book, as we go through the whole Bible, that it's all connected. It's all interwoven. And it's all coming together in this beautiful tapestry, right? And he's saying, hey, this, these aren't thoughts that I came up with. This was stuff that was revealed and shown to me by God. This isn't me at all. In fact, verse 12, for you have heard of my former conduct, verse 13, sorry, for you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. So Paul here is saying that he was a Jew among Jews. In fact, he was probably the best Jew. Let's say that he did everything to the nth degree. You know, he, there wasn't a jot or tittle that was out of place. There wasn't an I that wasn't, <laughs> an I that wasn't crossed or a T that wasn't dotted. <laughs> um, and so you look at this, <clears throat> and Paul's saying, hey, like, this was, this was my life before. This was, the, this was me following the law. This was me doing everything within my own power to follow God as best that I knew, and I persecuted the church. Verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through what? His grace. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. So Paul is saying in this, hey, it wasn't by my works that I was saved. In fact, it was very much the opposite. It was by my works that I persecuted the church. It was by my works and me putting the law onto people that I was holding them down. I was putting a burden on their back. In fact, it was a little bit more than that, wasn't it? He was raiding houses, taking Christians out of their houses, taking Christians from their families and persecuting them uh, for for lack of a stronger word. But Paul says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. We need to read that uh, almost with with a me, right? When it pleased God, who separated you from your mother's womb and called you through his grace. We've all been called. We've all been separated. We've all been pulled from the world by God's grace, not by our works. You know, I've got some really, really smart friends. Man, they make me look like a caveman sometimes, and they're happy to show it. Um, (laughs) But what I find is interesting is even though they're so smart, even though they're so prideful in their their, uh, intelligence, they can't see God. It's super curious. It's super interesting, right? Because you would assume, man, the more you could understand, the more you'd be able to under, like, know, the easier you'd be able to see God. But we know that it's a spiritual thing where God comes alongside you and he whispers into your ear and you hear his voice. And God says, hey, do you want this free gift? And then we have to decide a free gift to all who ask. But it's not by our works, lest any man should boast. It's by grace and grace alone that we have been chosen. And so praise God, because you have been chosen at this time, at this age, at this location for something great, to come into communion with God. I I know I say it all the time, but it's true. God would rather have died than to have spent eternity without you. Never forget that. Jesus laid his life down, being the perfect sacrifice, so that we could spend life eternal with him. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, verse 16, to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went instead to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. 
Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Hmm. Let's pause there. So Paul is giving an account here. If you don't know what happened, Paul was on his way to go uh, persecute more Christians. And then that's when Jesus showed up and uh, knocked Paul off of his horse. He said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? (laughs) And Paul goes, who are you, Lord? Says, I'm Jesus Christ. (laughs) And what's wild about all of that is that Paul gets out of this experience, out of this time, and he can't see. And he's taken to a town where he spends three days, and then a man comes and (laughs) prays for him, and and suddenly he can see. And so Paul is recounting what happened after that. He said, when I had this incredible encounter with Jesus, when I had this incredible encounter with God, I didn't immediately go rushing to other churches, but instead I took time to be with God. I did not go up to Jerusalem, but instead I went to Arabia and returned to Damascus. And I stayed, er, and then after three years. So he stayed there for three years. And I want to talk about being with Jesus, just being in the presence of God. Loving Jesus with everything, all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think it's beautiful, and it's, it's, it's the way that we grow. But it's beautiful to spend time with God in the cool of the morning or even the cool of the evening. And to just meditate upon his word and to spend time in communion with him. That's how we grow. That's how we come into a more beautiful love with him. That's how we can understand him. And the thing about grace... That's, that's so beautiful, is that if you are loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then your actions will follow. If you love God with everything that you have, then what you do will be out of a reflection of that love. I'm not married, but if, uh, if you've been married 5, 10, 15 years, then you'll know that the more time you spend with your significant other, the more you'll learn about that person, the more, the more deeper, the more intimate your relationship is with that person. In fact, my, uh, my brother-in-law married my sister, and I bet you, I bet you, you know Amber's uh, coffee order by heart. Yep. And I bet you sometimes Amber's thinking she wants a coffee, and I bet you you go, oh, you know what? I should get her a coffee. And I bet you you've given it to her, and it's exactly what she wanted, and she didn't even ask you for it. I bet you that's happened once. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so you look at that, and you go, oh, man, it was out of my brother-in-law's love for my sister that he did something to please her. And it's the same thing. It's not by works. He wasn't trying to get in good with, with my sister. He wasn't trying to make amends. He just loved her. And it was out of the love of his heart that he, got, that he did something physical. See, it's not by works that we're saved. It's not by trying to do things for God that we suddenly become better than others. In fact, uh, the, the Corinthians were trying to one-up each other um, in as trying to one-up each other in spiritual gifts. And maybe, maybe the Galatians were trying to one-up each other in following the law. Maybe. But what's interesting is in all of this, you will follow the law instinctively if you're loving Jesus. You don't need to worry about following this bit, following that bit, making sure that you tithe and that making sure that you don't eat pork again. All of that stuff was for the Jews, and that's the old covenant. But if you want to please the Father, if you want to please the Lord, 
Just love him. Love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then what you do after that will be because of that love, will be because of that that exuberant joy that you feel toward God. Ah, oh, Caleb, I don't, I don't have that. I don't have that love. I, I used to. I used to have that joy. I used to have that, that first love fire. But I, I just don't have it. And no matter how hard I try, I just can't get it back. <laughs> Dang it if I haven't been there. But what I've found to be a really good prayer four times like that is just to go, God, give me a hunger and thirst for your word. God, let me love you more tomorrow than I have today. Let me love you with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And may I, may I have more love for you tomorrow than I have today. And may we say that every day into eternity. Amen? And it's in all of this. It's in all of this that, you know, we're always worshiping something. Humans, our primary focus, our primary function is to worship. We are worshipers of something. It doesn't matter if it's God. It doesn't matter if it's career or family. We all have gods. In fact, even if you're agnostic or you're atheist, you most likely worship yourself, your ideas, your intellect. Or maybe you worship a very smart person. Who, uh, who tells you uh, what your thoughts are. We're always worshiping something. Every, yeah, every person who's alive today is a worshiper. But if we don't worship the God, if we don't love the God that created us, things get a little twisted, a little broken. And so maybe in your life, you might have accidentally started loving another God more than God. I'm not saying you have, but maybe that might be a case. And so it's always good to, to dig in deep and wonder, okay, God, why do I feel heavy? Why do I feel this burden on my shoulder? Why do I, if, you're, if your burden is light, why do I feel tired? Why do I feel exhausted? Because maybe there's something there. Maybe, maybe you've gotten slightly off track. That's why it's so good to dig into the Word. Did you know that um, if you were to walk straight in a line, you know, for, for 40 miles, you would actually be quite a bit off course? And the reason for that is that you favor one leg over another leg. And so if you walk straight for one mile, you know, and you, you, you say, okay, I'm going to walk due north, and you walk due north, and you keep walking... You'll probably be, you know, one mile, you'll be off by about six inches. And so, you know, you'll have to adjust and recalculate. But let's say you walk five miles. Well, maybe where you're supposed to be and where you are, maybe that's 10, 20 feet. Well, let's say you walk 20 miles and suddenly you're quite a bit off path. But if every day you align yourself with the Word of God, and you align your heart back with the counsel and the grace of God and the Word of God, and then it doesn't matter if you've gone off the beaten path just a little bit every day because you're always aligning and always getting back on the path. So all of that to say, how do you make sure that you don't get off the beaten path? How do you make sure that you are following God with everything? How do you make sure that you don't become like the Galatians who are suddenly following another gospel? Commune with Jesus. Talk with Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's just that simple. And what will happen? Verse 21. Actually, verse 22, and I was unknown by the face, by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which, once, which, which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. It was never about Paul. 
May people look upon your life and glorify God who's in heaven, right? Some of us, we come from wild backgrounds. And the minute we get saved, everyone notices, oh my goodness, who's this person? Wait, what did you do? Oh, I, 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 oh, I put my faith in Jesus. No, 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 seriously, what'd you do? No, I did that. Do you want to know about him? <laughs> and it's in that. It was even in, in this stark contrast with Paul that people glorified God because of what he did through Paul's life. So in your life, make sure that people are glorifying God. People are falling more in love with God. People are running after God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because truthfully, that's what matters. That relationship with God is all that matters. Oh, man. I'd love to talk more, but let's turn, turn to prayer, shall we? God, what a beautiful time. What a fantastic opportunity to, to learn about you. I thank you so much for, the, for the, the freedom that this chapter has brought me in my own life. And God, I pray that if anyone is here and they're struggling with something, just some form of oppression or sadness or tiredness or a weight, a burden, God, I pray that they give it to you, God. I pray that we remove all things that easily ensnare us that we grow in our love for you, God, that we love you and that we fall more madly in love with you with each moving breath. God, I pray again that we fall in love with you, that we love you with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. Thank you that you hold our tears in a bottle. Thank you that your thoughts toward us are more than the sands of the sea. And thank you that you know every single hair that's on my head. I thank you for that, Father. I love you. We love you. And in your name we pray. Amen. This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.